Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Wrap, brought to you by Michigan Medicine Headlines. I'm Dan Elman with the Department of Communication. And I'm Dan's co-host for the day, Bailey Merzik. We're going to have a fascinating discussion today in honor of World Delirium Awareness Day, giving you insight into the condition and how it can be treated at Michigan Medicine. Now, before we dive into that conversation, take a moment to get caught up on any episode of The Wrap you may have missed. You can find the shows on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or any other podcast hosting platform. New episodes are also available on the Michigan Medicine YouTube channel and as part of the headlines we can review. All right, let's bring in today's guests who are here to talk about delirium, what it is, and how it can be spotted. First, can we go around and have everyone introduce yourselves? Good morning, Dan and Bailey. I'm Jennifer Dammeyer. I'm the clinical nurse specialist for the critical care medicine unit, which is a medical intensive care unit in the adult hospital. I've also been the co-lead of the delirium committee for the institution. It's a multidisciplinary committee of physicians, nurses, physical therapists, respiratory therapists, um, social work, psychiatry. And so you're going to meet a few of those people today. Hi there, I'm Amy Roshinsky. I'm one of the physicians at Michigan Medicine. I did my medical school residency fellowship training all here, and I am a practicing psychiatrist who works on the consultation liaison service, which is a service that uh, sees patients on the medical and surgical units of Michigan Medicine, and I diagnose and treat many patients with delirium. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kelly Creel. I am a registered nurse on the orthopedic trauma floor at Michigan Medicine. And I also see many patients with delirium. I also um, was a part of a project for our unit-based committee surrounding delirium recognition on our floor. Good morning, my name is Jamie Banal. I'm a registered nurse at Michigan Medicine. I've been with the institution for about eight years. And currently I work in the surgical ICU. So we also see our fair share of delirium patients. Um, and currently I'm working on a project in the ICU quality improvement project on utilizing white noise to promote uh, sleep in the ICU and prevent delirium. Good morning, my name is Scott Schell. Uh, I'm a COVID-19 survivor. I am a uh, patient of uh, Dr. McSparrens and Pulse Clinic at U of M. And I'm happy to be here and uh, share some of my experiences with delirium. I'm Janet Schell, um, Scott's wife. Um, Road went down this journey with him, um, and we are proud parents of a Wolverine who lived across the street from the hospital. So we're big fans. Yes, outstanding. Go blue. Well, thank you all for being here. Um, and I know you're all going to give really unique perspectives on this uh, on this episode. So let's start with the basics. We've talked a lot about the word delirium. What is delirium, and what are some of the most common symptoms? So for a very formal medical definition, I have uh, delirium is an acute severe neuropsychiatric syndrome characterized by waxing and waning levels of consciousness and periods of inattention and confusion. Uh, so in more layman's terms, I would say just an altered level of consciousness that is acute, um, usually treatable and uh, with varying fluctuating uh, mental states. Um, there are a couple different types of delirium that we see, hypoactive or hyperactive or a mixed delirium, which is both of those traits. Um, and so with hypoactive delirium, you'll see a patient that's usually more lethargic, sleepy, uh, withdrawn. And with hyperactive, you'll see a patient that is usually more agitated or anxious or restless. Um, so I think that's part of the difficulty in identifying and treating delirium, that it covers such a broad span of behaviors. I think also just to piggyback off what, what Jamie said, a lot of people are afraid it's a psychiatric diagnosis because it can involve psychiatric symptoms like paranoia, delusions, hallucinations, mood changes, sadness. So many people might think their loved one has a psychiatric problem, but this is really more of a medical diagnosis. It's something that happens to, pe that happens to people who are medically ill in the hospital. Um, and it is reversible, and it's not the same thing as dementia, which is a more gradual loss of uh, cognitive function. Delirium is more acute in onset and generally reversible, but very frightening to patients and their families. Is it also a challenge because sort of the word delirious has entered sort of the lexicon, right? Like, oh, I'm delirious right now. 
but there is sort of that medical aspect to it. People sort of think they know what it is, but that's not what it is, right? I would say often that's the scariest part. So we use the term, like you were saying, kind of, it's it's kind of become a word where people can just use until you see your loved one um, in, a, in a state of delirium. And it is very shocking to families. Um, and, and that takes a lot of education surrounding why this is happening and what we can do to prevent it. Yeah, so why is delirium so important to be aware of and to address? So Jamie, I can speak to this first and we can kind of talk back and forth if you want to. So um, I think why it's so important to address it is because delirium is serious and it's also preventable in the hospital. It causes um, distress within patients who have experienced delirium. And I'm, I'm so glad that we have Scott here as a, as a patient um, that experienced delirium, um, but they can, they do remember it. Yes. And it's, it can be very um, alarming to patients and to their families. Um, the other thing it can cause is it really slows the healing process and the recovery process. Um, so it can lead to prolonged hospitalizations. Um, there are higher mortality rates associated with um, delirium and including also things that we do try to prevent. So hospital acquired infection, falls, pressure injuries, all of these things can result from delirium. Absolutely. And um, in addition to complications and length of stay, there's also a huge cost factor to delirium. Um, I found a number that says that they estimate $152 billion in annual U.S. healthcare expenditures expenditures related to um, delirium and uh, the length of stay. Um, and specific to the ICU where I work, up to 70% of older adults will experience delirium while they're in the ICU um, with acute medical conditions, post-operative, all that complication. And really, like we said too, I think the most important thing is that it's so stressful for patients and their families. It's if we can prevent and or appropriately manage delirium, uh, that I think takes a huge burden off of people's hospital stays. I wanted to add that we consider it a medical emergency. The more days that you experience delirium, the worse outcomes for you later on after you leave the hospital. So you physically may be all back and you can run a marathon, but you may not be able to go back to the job that you were doing before because it's impacted your ability to think clearly. Yeah, so we've talked a lot about, you know, what happens after you you go through delirium. What about leading into delirium? Are there risk factors such as age, previous medical conditions that put you at higher risk of acquiring delirium? Dan, those are exactly uh, some of the main risk factors. So older age, pre-existing cognitive impairment, like someone with dementia is at higher risk. People with hearing loss or visual impairment uh, people with prior brain injuries. Uh, and then the more sick that you are medically in the hospital, the higher the risk you have of getting delirium. It's why Jamie and Jennifer in their intensive care units um, see so much delirium. Uh, Scott, with COVID-19, when we had COVID-19 patients surging in 2020 and 2021, and those patients were critically ill, we saw a lot of delirium with COVID. Um, so people in organ failure, people who uh, have been victims of trauma. Uh, so the, the more medically ill you are, the more likely you have a chance of developing delirium. And I would pick, piggyback off of that also and say, um, Jamie and I both work in you know post-surgical areas. So uh, anesthesia, surgery, those things also can, can play a big role in someone developing delirium as well. Absolutely. And also um, like medications that people are on, uh, can cause delirium, can affect it. Um, being in like alcohol or drug withdrawal, if you're in the hospital, um, infection, immobility. Um, basically, I think that you could say that anybody who's in the hospital is at risk for developing delirium because everybody has a, a risk factor. And also um, with age being a huge risk factor for delirium, we're seeing such an older, pop like people are living longer. We're seeing an older population in the hospital. We've got medical uh, advances that we're doing surgeries on older patients. It's not unusual for me to have um, like an 80 year old post-operative patient in the ICU. Um, so I think as the population is older um, and we're seeing older patients, we're gonna see a continued risk and increase of delirium, which makes it so important. 
Yeah, so now shifting to a pers provider perspective, if you're treating a patient with delirium, what, what role do you guys play in helping manage a patient that may have delirium? Yeah, great question, Bailey. Um, so as a provider, so that could be a physician or a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant, that's what we mean by provider. Uh, if a nurse alerts us that they're concerned that the patient may have delirium, we would uh, go over some of the diagnostic criteria and do some rating scales. There's some validated rating scales like the confusion assessment method that also has an intensive care unit version. Uh, and so we can do those rating scales and, and confirm the diagnosis. Then we try to look and, and find out what was the cause of the delirium. And many of the things that increase someone's risk of developing delirium are the causes. So we try to look at their lab values, see if they're in organ failure, see if they have electrolyte problems. Are they infected? Are they not getting enough oxygen? Is some of the medications that we're pumping into them, like in the COVID patients, they were needing high levels of sedation and that sedation was causing some of them to develop delirium. Um, we would help manage any associated symptoms of the delirium. So if a patient is in extreme distress, paranoid, agitated, um, we may help by giving them medications to try to ease some of those symptoms, try to help with their sleep, try to help with their pain. Um, we would also try to get rid of unnecessary devices. So things like catheters, so urinary catheters, lines, um, those things can actually perpetuate delirium. So if we can safely get rid of them, we would work with the nurses and, and coordinate and see if it's safe to get rid of them. And then providing education to family and friends. I would honestly say my nursing colleagues on this call uh, do the, the best job of that. But as providers, we should be doing that as well of telling families what this is, using the terminology, explaining how we diagnosed it, explaining what we're doing to address it. Those are some of the things I would do as a provider. In the intensive care unit, we actually have a national standard, a bundle that we call ICU liberation. And we have the ABCs of ICU liberation. So trying to liberate somebody who's on a ventilator, because traditionally when people are on a ventilator, it's really upsetting. They have a lot of anxiety and they almost try to fight that ventilator because it's so unnatural. So we use sedation and we don't want to leave somebody sedated because the medication that we use to sedate actually can contribute to delirium. So we want to shut it off every day. So through the ABCs, we want to make sure that we assess their pain because pain can also cause delirium. If it's something unusual and scary, then you can it contributes to delirium. Then uh, the B is for breathing trial. So we make sure that we do the best to do a trial to see if the patient can come off the ventilator. C is for choice of sedation. So can we shut the sedation off? You know, is the person awake enough and able to cooperate and understand what's happening so that we can keep it off and maybe just give them something every once in a while to relax them? D is the delirium screen. E is early mobility. Ideally, a patient on a ventilator shouldn't have any sedation. They should be up upright, vertical with their feet on the ground and moving. So we have physical therapists that will bring a treadmill into the ICU, into the room and walk a patient next to the bed while they're attached to the ventilator. Um, also F is for family. So really having family there, familiar items, bringing in their eyeglasses, their hearing aids, pictures, even a blanket from home, things that are familiar to them. Um, in order to contribute to getting them off and, and liberated from the intensive care unit. I love that. Um, you know, and, and I was going to ask about treatment options for delirium. I think we've touched on that a little bit, but let me go in a slightly different direction. From what you're saying, it, it seems to me there's no one size fits all approach to treating delirium, right? It's going to be each individual patient based on what providers or others think the contributing factors are. Yes, I agree with that 100%. Um, it's very individualized. And so we look at each patient, whether they're in the intensive care unit or on the medical floor and try to address the contributing factors um, and come up with a treatment plan for each patient. Um, I will say we're often asked as, you know, I'm a psychiatrist, so my expertise is in behavioral symptoms. So, you know, we do, we don't have an FDA approved medication that treat delirium. So the treatment is to prevent it in the first place, if we can, which we can't always, um, that can be insulting to patients. They, oh, I could have just prevented it. And, you know, we can't, that'd be insulting to Scott. Um, but 
I think there's no FDA approved medication to treat the delirium. So we try to prevent, we try to fix the underlying causes as best we can. We try to do no harm by adding things. Um, there's certain medications that can make delirium worse. So high amounts of opioids, benzodiazepines or sedatives, anticholinergic meds can make the delirium worse. Um, some of the medicines, medicines that can be helpful for the symptoms of delirium, they don't fix the underlying process, but they can treat the symptoms are some of the psychiatric medicines that I would use. And that's upsetting to families when I say, hey, I want to use a, a Haldol or Risperdal or Lanzapine or Seroquel. And the family asks, well, is, what is that? And it's an antipsychotic. And they say, well, my loved one doesn't have schizophrenia, but these medications can be helpful in treating some of the distress, agitation, paranoia, um, hallucinations, and, and help reset the sleep-wake cycle. And then that provides comfort. So one of my main jobs when I get consulted to these ICUs or floors is to help address the distressing symptoms that the patient is having. I would say the biggest people we always turn to also are the families. So how is your loved one at baseline? Um, how, you know, what could we bring? Like someone, I think Jennifer was saying, bringing things in from home, um, things that make your your loved one feel comfortable, having familiar social contacts in the room so that they know that they're safe. Um, and that's where as a bedside nurse, we rely heavily on families. And that's where I think it can be a little distressing to them that, you know, I don't know why this is happening, but then we also turn to, you know, for, for questions and, um, and I, but I do think the families are super helpful in, in helping, um, treat, not treat, you know, treat in, but also to make their loved ones feel more comfortable. And just one thing about that. One of the hardest things with COVID-19 was that families were not allowed in the rooms. Um, and so it was devastating. I think all of us here worked uh, in the hospital. The ICU nurses I have the utmost respect for because they were in the thick of it. But I was here as well, some of the providers, and seeing the patients struggling with delirium and not being able to have their family members present in the room, um, I think made delirium a lot worse. I think there's studies that show that. There's studies that show that there were probably worse outcomes. It wasn't our fault. We were doing the best that we could, and we were trying to be safe for everybody. But it was really heartbreaking, um, not just for delirium, but for a lot of other reasons to see um, families not be able to be at their bedside of their loved one when this was going on. Absolutely. Um, I was going to add that one of the main concerns with our patients when we're experiencing or have patients that are experiencing delirium is their safety because they are con acutely confused and um, can be hallucinating, can be scared. Um, so we often have patients that are trying to self-extubate or, um, you know, pull at their IV lines that can be providing life-saving medication, trying to get out of bed when they're not strong enough um, or able to do so independently. Um, so it, it was especially difficult during COVID that we weren't able to have um, family members bedside. We have patient attendants in the hospital that we can utilize when somebody needs like 24-7 uh, monitoring somebody at bedside at all times, but it is so much better for the patients when it's able to be their family members. Um, now that things have kind of uh, regulated again post-COVID, we have a 24-hour visiting policy. So patients, family members, um, or friends, whatever family is to them are able to be um, with their loved ones. And I think that that is huge at helping manage um, delirium symptoms and helping to uh, break the acute Please. One of the things that can happen and um, patients can experience is post-traumatic stress from having delirium. And so we encourage families, we have this thing called ICU diaries, that we give them a notebook and we'd say, write everything down, write down everything that you can, you know, experience as a family member there so that you can connect the dots for the patient later on when they have questions around what was happening you know, I remember this going on. And if the um, family member can say, no, that, you know, that wasn't, there wasn't 20 people in your room. It was the curtain and, and two people, you know, it, it just helps to, to put it together so that um, they understand that they were experiencing something awful, but it wasn't, the family member was there and, and thought that everything was appropriate and they could comfort them later with that. So getting a little more specific again, what, what interventions are done to help prevent delirium from happening in the first place? 
So I spoke about the ICU liberation, and those are very specific. Um, we also have uh, mnemonics to help us think of through all of the possible ways that somebody bec can become delirious. Um, there is one called delirious, and it's um, drugs, make sure you have early mobility, check their labs, all of those things to cue you in. And so it really takes a team. Pharmacists should be reviewing those medications every day. And if the patient's experiencing a fluctuating mental status or some acute hallucinations, they should be looking to say, what medications did we add today that now the patient is experiencing this? And can we change that or lower the dose? Uh, physical therapy should be there doing mobility with the patient. You know, um, social work could be talking to the family around what else can they bring in to help support the patient and what can we do for them after they leave. So it really does take a team to think about and contribute to that prevention. One nice program at Michigan Medicine that some people may not be aware of is it's called the Hospital Elder Life Program. And it was developed based on work from a geriatrician named Sharon Inouye. And it's a non-pharmacologic prevention strategy of having volunteers come in to certain units um, with elderly patients and reorient them, give them puzzles, make sure that they have hydration, make sure they have their glasses, hearing aids, do some visits with them, cognitively stimulate them. Um, and, and so that program has been shown to reduce the incidence of delirium in some evidence-based studies. So we do have that available in a few units and it's volunteer um, driven. So some of our U of M undergrads do that study. Before we bring Scott in, can we just talk real quick about sort of the logistics, right? So if a patient has been identified as having symptoms of delirium, you've all talked about how you need to bring in, you know, pharmacists and social work and nursing and, you know, and the providers themselves. How does that sort of team approach get put into action? You know, like once those symptoms have been identified, all of a sudden a whole team is going to come and help out. How does that work? I, I can speak to that because it's more of the bedside nursing nurses. So we um, screen every shift for delirium. We have a screening tool um, within our flow sheet um, documentation. If a patient screens positive, it's the bedside nurse's job to then alert the providers. Um, and from there, that's kind of where the dominoes start to fall. So um, we start to talk about things like putting patients on sleep protocol. So we're not going into the middle of the night and waking them up to get vital signs. Um, as everyone was talking about different medications, starting to look at those um, and where we can kind of pull back, uh, removing catheters, removing excessive lines. So it's really at that point, once once the, the bedside nurses start to notice um, a change in behavior or a, you know, a sh like we were talking about the fluctuation in behavior, um, it's really our, our job as the eyes on the patient to start to alert the team that, you know, something is something is wrong. Um, and, and kind of, again, like I said, the domino falls from there. I would say from a consultant perspective, so the nurse, like Kelly was saying, would notify the first contact of the primary medical or surgical team. Uh, and then that team, if they try some of those interventions and they're struggling, they can put consults in for things like psychiatry, geriatrics, uh, music therapy, art therapy, uh, visits from pets. Uh, so those consults can be then placed by the primary team. Occupational therapy, physical therapy are also really important as well. Yeah, and I was going to say in the ICU, um, what this looks like is every morning, uh, the team all comes together to do grand rounds on the patients. So you have the physician, the pharmacist, the respiratory therapist, the bedside nurse, um, sometimes social work, uh, those consult services sometimes, everybody is together standing in the middle of the hallway outside of the patient's doors um, and on the the, the window um, door wall, we actually have that ICU uh, liberation bundle form that Jennifer was talking about. And so the whole team will kind of review what's going on with the patient. And then we actually discuss and address each of those factors in a very systematic way. And uh, just to make sure that like nothing is being missed and everybody is on board and everybody's aware of the plan. And um, again, now that we have families present at all times, we welcome and encourage them to be a part of that conversation so that they're included and know that um, these concerns are being addressed and kind of um, involved in what the plan of care is moving forward. Yes, yeah, so that was some great information you guys shared. I think it'll be very helpful for people to hear. 
um, some of the things they may not have known. Um, but now let's turn from the, the provider perspective to, to a patient perspective. So Scott, um, thank you for waiting, but um, we'll turn to you now. What was your experience like as a patient with delirium? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, where do I start? <laughs> I had so many episodes of delirium. Uh, Jennifer, you talked about a notebook and uh, I just wrote, wrote an outline, but it, it really started when I came out of the coma. So I was, I was vented. They tried several things and uh, nothing worked, including my bad mask. So um, things were bad enough and I had to go on a vent. So I called her, told her, and then next 11 days I was in a coma. They brought me out of the coma a few times. I think once to ask if I was in pain, got morphine. But anyway, when they finally brought me out, it was my spontaneous breathing trial, which uh, was nothing short of absolutely terrifying. Um, so I woke up in my mind, I was convinced I had been shipped away to the Caribbean as though I was some kind of leper, somebody that just had to be removed from the country. So of all places, I woke up in this bar so I'm in my hospital bed with a nurse at the foot of my bed working on a laptop. And over here, everybody's having a grand time in the bar. My arms are restrained. I cannot move and I cannot breathe. Now, I didn't know I was still intubated. So in my mind, I could still talk. So this went on for, I think, two hours. I kept pleading with the nurse, please cut me loose. I was in utter panic. The adrenaline was just raging because I couldn't breathe. And... Uh, I must have just grunted or something. I, you know, looking back, I was still intubated. So each time I did this in my mind, asked her, please cut me loose. She would look over at me and then she'd go back to working on her laptop. She never said one word, at least that I knew of. So to me, she was very cold, uh, didn't care. And it was like a form of torture. So I'm watching these people and they're having a grand old time. Well, pretty soon the lights start turning off. The bar is closing. They're going to leave me. And the panic just amped up all the more. So one last time I pleaded with her, please cut me loose. And same result, she just looked, went back to her laptop. So I broke loose of my restraints. And I saw somebody running through the windows while another nurse came in. And she got literally almost nose to nose with me and brought me back to reality. She said, do you have any idea what you've just done? You're in Troy Beaumont Hospital. And my eyes must have been like saucers because to me, I had been shipped away. Uh, so that was kind of the first delirium, but there's so many more. I don't know what um, what else would be helpful or how much time we have, but I've, I've got quite a few stories. So you talk about the teens having conversations in the hallway. Yeah. He perceived it. And I think this was when they brought him out while he was still on the vent. He perceived that they were having a discussion about who was going to get a vent and who was going to be left to die. And I don't know how he would even know because the, he, the trauma yeah, it was so me. very early. So whatever conversations, um, and then another really striking one, and we have had to work through this one. Um, he kept, and he came home, he kept talking about people were completing suicide in the hospital. And he had vivid memories of a woman with glass and putting her wrists on the glass. So this is the woman next door in the next room. And the way the nurse's station was set up was, when they're sitting there, they can see, observe that room and that room. So in those two windows, I'm looking through mine over to hers. And in my mind, she had somehow broken part of the top of the window and cut her wrists on the window and the rope notes in blood on the glass. You don't care about us COVID patients. Well, I went back to the hospital. I've gone back every year on the anniversary of my discharge just to thank them. And well, this last time, I was sharing some of this and the one nurse had like, you could see she had this light bulb moment. She was talking to the other nurse. She said, do you remember right after he was intubated, we had a flood of people like the next day and things were so chaotic. We were writing notes to each other and with that red Sharpie on the window. And so some of it was real, but my mind would just warp it into this, you yeah. know, and, then I, and I saw, supposedly I saw the staff, you know, cleaning up all the blood on the floor. I saw a contractor replacing the window. None of that happened. And and I'm sure, you know, the the nurse that you said didn't care about you and just went back to taking notes, that may not have been real, right? That may have been part of the delirium as well. It's, it real. Right, I mean, it's I mean, mixing up the reality and, and the delirium, yeah. Now, Janet, a, a quick question for you. 
Um, were you told or aware that delirium was a possible complication of Scott, you know, when he got COVID-19 and was, uh, you know, hospitalized? Were you aware of A, what delirium was, um, and B, that it was a potential uh, complication of the COVID-19 and the intubation? And then from there, were you educated about it once it did sort of hit? I, I think I have a very unusual experience. I think the average wife in my shoes probably would not have known that if they had any medical experience possibly um and i don't but i had um i i had it as a child when i had measles so i knew what that was like um just before scott was ill his mom had had catastrophic falls and had been in and out of the hospital we had her in our home in hospice care so i was dealing as he was on the vent i was dealing with his mother down the hall from me in severe delirium, banging on the walls and the hospice pulled out. So I had, I literally had it going on and I didn't think at the time because he was vented. It was after she passed, he came off the vent and then things started to make sense to me. So it could kick in, I need the iPad, I need to call him often. Um, I had lived at her bedside while he was working, I could work remotely. so. I mean, I was her advocate. We had to get a posy bed. She had another catastrophic. I experienced all of that. They, the, what was different in her case is they kept telling me she had dementia and her neurologist was out of town. And I kept saying she doesn't have dementia. She has a UTI and she had a catastrophic fall and they forgot to plug the bed in. So she fell again. And so she was in extreme duress. So I knew that, but I think I'm unusual in, in the experiences that I had. I knew to ground her. Um, I would get, you know, get in her face, open up the posy bed, go in and conversations about our sons and connect with her and she would calm down. So fast forward to we bring her home from hospice, it's happening again. Um, and then with Scott, I recognized the symptoms once he started, uh, he was able to tell me and then when he got home, um, and that's why I pushed so hard for him to um, get into U of M, I was looking for a wraparound services like the Pulse Clinic. I had heard about that through the COVID survivor group. Um, and that's when things started to change when we were able to get him the psychotherapy that he could deal with. the Because it wasn't just the trauma of what happened and his mom and just so many things. It was also this, I, I didn't realize it would stay so long that it would affect him and his cognition because he mild cognitive impairment. Now, that's what I did not know. He was only 57. He wasn't 88 like her. I was going to say, I think that's a great point that Janet makes is that, and Jennifer pointed to this earlier about post-traumatic stress disorder from an ICU experience or from delirium itself. And for COVID-19, most people uh, had both. And, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms can include nightmares, uh, flashbacks of the event, avoidance of thinking about medical things, numbing, feeling numb, having irritable moods. Um, and, and psychotherapy is an amazing treatment for post-traumatic stress disorder. So I think Scott is in this post-ICU uh, clinic at Michigan Medicine that helps address some of the emotional sequelae of ICU stays in delirium as well as cognitive. So one of the problems with delirium is that for some patients who have delirium, or we also saw this with COVID, which most patients had delirium with COVID, they had cognitive impairment that persisted. Um, most of the time we say delirium is reversible, but it does have adverse effects on the cognition. And so if you test someone pre and post having COVID, their cognitive function is often impaired with COVID or with delirium. So I'm glad, Scott, that, you know, you and Janet are, are getting support for that. The good news is we just got a, um, a second round of a neuropsych evaluation analysis. Three of them. Yeah. So the first one was, yes, first one was in 21. This one was, what, two weeks ago, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm. And there's there's a lot of improvement. So uh, that, that was huge for me. <laughs> a lot of hope. Yeah. Congratulations. That's great. Okay. So just one final quick question. Um, for Scott, how is life now post delirium for you? You know, I have I I have PTSD. I'd like to think it's not as bad. Um, the social work through Pulse Clinic has been huge for me, very helpful. But um, you know, parts of me physically are compromised. My lungs, um, you know, my brain, 
Uh, I have some uh, neuropathy in my left foot they think was from when I was prone and now I've got some vertebrae, pinch of nerve. Uh, so there's some physical things. Um, yeah, I went through so much grief. Uh, so there a lot of loss, uh, even the loss of who I used to be, um, you know, mentally and uh, um, <laughs> I tell people I used to be a pretty smart guy. <laughs> you are smart. But uh, uh, so, you know, there's been a lot to walk through uh, emotionally, physically, um, but I think I've come a long way. Definitely. Yeah. It's like a sim he ex described it like a crescendo symphony for him. And I think that's really important. It isn't just one event and maybe he could have healed a little bit faster because it was a delay in a year. There were so many um, individual things that just kind of crescendoed, um, you know, I, I mentioned that we're in Oxford, so our community the stress of what's going on in our community. He saw everything I was going through. Um, our son served at the Capitol in the midst of all this. After we had to pull him home from the guard. And we have just had so much stress. So a lot of those um, outside stressors can I think make or break um, healing. And it, it, it's so important to, for someone who had never been in therapy, never, n our, nobody in our family, I think, you know, a couple extended family. So for us, this was a big step to say, wait a minute, we're going to see a psychiatrist or, and, and, and remove that stigma in your brain. And it has been, um, the team at the pulse clinic and Mara, I would argue sometimes saved his life. I think that his mental health, that part of his life, and, and he's able to, I've seen such improvement that maybe we even might volunteer eventually, um, that kind of thing. It's being about will. It's being willing to reach out for help when you need it, and I'm so glad that you guys have done that because there are people there to help you, no matter what you need. Yeah, lots of rehab, lots of you know speech therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy. There's all of that that um, I can't say enough of how much that will impact you if you just will do it. Yeah. You have you have to take those steps. And I I had many several rounds of all of those. I had three yeah. or four rounds of PT, speech mm -hmm. therapy. Uh, I've been helping, uh, working with Mira, a uh, mm -hmm. social worker in Pulse Clinic. But yeah, to your point, uh, you know, I was willing and, and open. It's like, uh, you know, if you're offering, sure, I'll take you up on it. And uh, it's really paid off. Well, that's great to hear. Thank you so much, Scott and Janet, for sharing your story. And thank you to all of our guests for sharing this important information on World Delirium Awareness Day. It's a topic not often discussed, but it's incredibly important that we do um, talk about it and, and treat it in the best ways possible here at Michigan Medicine. If you want to learn more about delirium, go to mmheadlines.org. That's mmheadlines.org. And while you're there, you can check out other featured stories from this week, including details of the ongoing Vital Voices Engagement Survey and a celebration of Patient Safety Awareness Week. You can find all that and more at mmheadlines.org. All right, it's time for the weekly trivia contest. First, congratulations to Dustin Wise, who sent in the correct answer to last week's question about free little libraries now located at the Frankel Cardiovascular Center. Dustin, a member of the Department of Communication, will be in touch shortly to help you claim your prize. Now for this week's question, here's Bailey. This week's question is, what is the theme of this year's Patient Safety Awareness Week? Once again, what is the theme of this year's Patient Safety Awareness Week? And I will mention that having Delirium Awareness Day and Patient Safety Awareness Week, I think is great. They, the two tie in together so well. So um, we're going to have some information about that as well. Um, but you can find the answer to the trivia question this week in headlines. And once you know it, you can send it to headlines at med.umich.edu for the chance to win a prize. Uh, that's all we have for today. Thank you so much to all of our guests for joining us. And thank you, as always, to our listeners and viewers for everything you do for patients, families, and each other. We'll see you next time.